Hi everyone, welcome back to Useful Genetics. This is lecture 11i. We're going to talk about the genetics of aging. We'll talk about longevity, how much of it is controlled by our genes, and syndromes where aging is very much accelerated and definitely caused by genes. We'll talk about the risk fact, the heritability of certain causes of death, particularly Alzheimer's disease, and we'll talk about risk factors and causation, discussing what we know and how much we still don't know. Finally, we'll end with a couple of interventions that either work or don't work. We're all going to grow old and die, unless perhaps we don't live that long. This is a graph of the age of death of Swedish women born in 1900. And you can see that the great majority of them lived into their 70s, 80s, and their 90s. So little spike here, those are the ones who didn't live long enough to grow old. That was the 1918 influenza epidemic. Now, if we ask how much of how long we live is determined by our genes, and you remember when we talked about heritability, we talked about tests involving comparing um, phenotypes between identical twins who have all their genes in common and between fraternal twins, non-identical twins, who have only 50% of their genes in common. And these graphs show the comparison for lifespan of pairs of twins. And the bottom line is there's not much correlation even in the identical twins. So the heritability of lifespan is considered to be only about 15 to 30 percent. So a, not a lot of how long you live is determined by your genes. However, the heritability of aging does look a little higher if you consider only the factors that determine whether we live to be very old indeed. So this is a study of people who had a sibling who lived to be age 100. And in this case, it was found that having a sibling who lived to be very old doesn't predict your chances of living into your 60s or your 70s, but it does have a strong influence on your chances of living into your 80s or 90s. We can look at aging, genetics of aging from the other direction and ask about the genetics of premature aging. These are called progeroid syndromes, accelerated aging, and they do exist, although they're very rare. Um, they have a number of different names, often called progeria. Um, and in general, most of these syndromes are caused by single gene mutations in DNA repair pathways. And this is consistent with one of the many theories about why we age, which is the DNA damage theory. This theory posits that the reasons our bodies gradually get more and more decrepit is because DNA repair can't keep up with DNA damage. When we're young, DNA repair is doing a good job, but eventually the damage overwhelms the DNA repair machinery, and gradually DNA damage and the accumulating mutations that it causes lead to worse and worse cellular function, and thus to even worse DNA repair, even worse, etc. You see where we're going. Another way to look at the genetics of aging is to say, well, what about you know, the things we actually die of? How heritable are the common causes of death? And well, most of us, men and women, most of us are going to die of coronary artery disease. And heritability is moderately high in males, not so high in females. Most of the rest of us are going to die from stroke, and again, heritability is not very high. Um, we talked earlier about heritability of death from particular cancer syndromes. We know of genes that increase the risk of particular syndromes, but we don't have much heritability for general risk of dying from cancer. For Alzheimer's disease, the heritability is substantially higher. It's 0.74. However, this is for the disease it's not for Alzheimer's disease as a cause of death, probably because people more often die with Alzheimer's disease, and they're not recorded as dying of Alzheimer's disease, although often Alzheimer's disease is the ultimate reason that they die. So let's think a bit more about the genetics of Alzheimer's disease. 
there's only one well-established risk factor for Alzheimer's disease, and that's a protein of a type that we met in Module 3. The gene and the protein are called ApoE, and ApoE is a lipoprotein. We encountered these in Module 3 when we talked about proteins involved in transporting substances through the blood. The lipoproteins serve as escorts. They bind to the surface of droplets of fat and cholesterol that are being transported in the blood, and they serve as little delivery tags indicating where the um, droplets of fat should go. Are they going out from the liver to the tissues? Or are they going back from the tissues to the liver? So we know what ApoE does. We know that one of the three alleles of ApoE is associated with a substantially higher risk of Alzheimer's disease. And this is a very common allele. And we know, and you'll be asking this question because of what we learned when we talked about GWAS, you'll be asking, is ApoE causal. Is this just because there's SNPs in ApoE that are near to some other gene that's causing the risk of Alzheimer's? Or is it that the changes in ApoE are directly causing the risk? And the answer is it's the changes in ApoE itself. There's two positions where there's changes. They're both in the coding region and they both result in the replacement of cysteine with arginine at codons 1112 and 158. You certainly don't need to know this information, but this is just to confirm that we know that these mutations are somehow doubling the risk of Alzheimer's disease, but we don't know how. We have no idea how these mutations cause these increased risks. On the other hand, there are two other proteins where we, we know what they do, but we, they are not implicated in risk. These are the proteins that cause the structures called plaques and tangles in the brains of patients with Alzheimer's. Um, plaques are formed of a protein called beta amyloid. Tangles are formed of a protein called tau. Both of these accumulate to high levels in the brains of patients with Alzheimer's. And so, of course, the obvious question is, are the plaques and tangles, the beta amyloid and tau protein, actually causing the deterioration of brain function? And to a first approximation, um, genetics would say, well, there's certainly a correlation for the beta amyloid protein, at least. Um, and they both come from genetic studies of particular populations. One is a highly inbred village in Colombia. You'll remember that inbred villages are very likely to have many homozygous individuals and to have perhaps particular alleles at high frequency. In this village, many people have early onset Alzheimer's disease, and they have a mutation that changes the beta amyloid precursor protein and affects the risk of getting Alzheimer's. This is clearly causal. However, this is early onset Alzheimer's, which may be different than late onset Alzheimer's. However, confirmation comes from another study of people in Iceland, where they examined a mutation in, again, the beta amyloid precursor protein, found a particular mutation that reduced the risk of Alzheimer's. The mutation was five times less common in people with Alzheimer's. Again, saying that less beta, less Alzheimer's. So both of these support a causal role for the beta amyloid protein in Alzheimer's disease. But beta protein does not show up as a risk factor in genome-wide association studies, neither does the tau protein. So to a first approximation, we really don't know what role these are playing, whether they are causal or whether they are a consequence of something else going wrong. Now, two last ideas for um, preventing or reducing aging. What about telomeres? Remember, we talked about telomeres when we talked about what 
chromosomes need to function. Telomeres are the special sequences at the ends of chromosomes where there are many copies of short repeats that allow the ends to fold back on themselves and replicate properly. Otherwise, the ends of chromosomes gradually get shorter as we age. In fact, the ends of our chromosomes do get shorter nevertheless as we age, but it's worse if they don't have telomeres. So there's been lots of interest in finding out whether interventions that keep our telomeres long will help prevent aging. And there's sort of tantalizing studies in mice, but there's nothing that has any therapeutic implications at all. You wouldn't gather this from looking at the advertising. There are a lot of products in the health food stores and um, test kits as well offering to help maintain your telomeres. Telomere support for your body, telomere support for your skin. It's going to prevent aging, keep those wrinkles away. There's no evidence that any of it works. And um, like the mitochondrial um, therapies that are being sold, it's really pretty pricey. Now, luckily, there is one thing that's been shown to reduce aging. It's not genetics at all. Um, you've seen these mice already. These are our mitochondrial mutation mice. You'll remember that they have high rates of mutations in their mitochondrial DNA. This is the um, kind of cause that is consistent with the DNA damage theory of aging. But what's keeping this mouse young isn't longer telomeres, it's exercise. This is the mouse that's been running on the treadmill for three quarters of an hour three times a week. And this predicts along with a great deal of other data about the interaction between exercise and aging, predicts that the best thing you can do to stay young is to get lots of exercise. So we've talked about longevity and premature aging, premature aging caused by specific mutations that support a particular theory of aging, and longevity which turns out not to be very heritable, unless you're lucky enough to have relatives who live to be very old indeed. Talked about the heritability of causes of death, of which the only one with striking heritability is Alzheimer's disease. Talked about a risk factor for Alzheimer's that we know what the protein does, but we don't know what it has to do with um, Alzheimer's. And we talked about two proteins whose um, appearance in Alzheimer's we understand, but which are not implicated as risk factors by genome-wide association studies. Finally, we talked about how we can't slow down aging by intervening with, to support our telomeres, but we can by getting lots of exercise. Coming up next, well, I can't tell you what's coming up next because it's going to be the popular request lecture, and I don't know what that's going to be yet, but I hope to see you there.